Um. I'm used to looking out and there being actually little people running around. So this is <laughs> awesome. Although I will point out to you, I did shower this morning. So if anybody feels, yes, thank you. <laughs> and he feels like they wanted to move closer. Um, so we are going to be picking up um, in the middle of a Bible study that you are probably more familiar with than I am since I have been downstairs. Uh, but we are going to pick up in chapter 7. Um, we'll probably backtrack a little bit, talk about some things, and go through. Um, it really just was so interesting spending the time to look over this this week. And um, I know that if there are things from this chapter that you wonder about and I didn't cover um, that Pastor, or, uh, Pastor Derek will be doing next week's, and then Pastor Greg will be back after that. So hopefully any holes that are left there for you, we can all ask about uh, when, he, <laughs> when he gets back. Uh, but let's open up in prayer, and then we have uh, a few songs to sing. And, um, and then we're just going to start flipping through slides and taking a look at the book of Revelation together, which is exciting. Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you that all through... Uh, this building, there is teaching of your word going on. I thank you that we're able to do that for the kids downstairs. I thank you that we are able to do that up here as well, Lord. I thank you that there is never a point in time that we can say we have reached the end of the Bible and we know it all. Um, it is your word to us. It is your uh, constantly. It is your constant word, but you are constantly adding to our knowledge as we seek it out and as we look. And I think I would say for everyone that probably this book of Revelation is the one that holds the most wonder and curiosity and also maybe a little intimidation. Um, and so we're going to look at that together, Father, and I just pray that you know, we will walk away tonight, if nothing else, wanting to go look at more, to go read more, to go study more, and then to go home and ask you what you want to reveal to us individually as well. So we pray for your blessings tonight, God. We pray for our pastor and his wife that you will continue just to bless them with a time of rest and refreshment. We thank you for the decades of marriage and ministry that they have had so far and that they have shared with all of us and that you will just bring them home with a renewed strength and desire to minister in your name and we thank you for that tonight in jesus name and we all said amen. amen all right so i don't actually know if you guys stand or you sit during worship so you do you <laughs> if you would like to stand during worship please feel free and if you don't don't make me feel like you have to but we're going to sing a few songs this morning this evening it's not this morning it <laughs> is this evening I'm going to sing one of my favorites. I don't hear it as much here um, as we, as I didn't mean to bully you into standing. I just really don't know whether you stand or not on Wednesday nights. Um, this is one of my favorite songs, um, just to sing How Great Is Our God, and then we'll move um, into How Great Thou Art. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps Himself in light And darkness tries to hide And it trembles out
which he stands and time is in his hands the beginning and the end beginning and the end the God had three in one you're the Father Spirit Son the Lion and the about the end tonight and how we don't have to be afraid Lord because you wrote the beginning of the book God and you wrote the end of the book hallelujah thank you for your greatness God and sings my soul
when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart that I shall bow in And all the time, God is good. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing and singing with us. And thank you to the musicians who did that on the fly with no practice. Aren't they awesome? They are. So when we start talking about Revelation... I think everybody who has maybe grown up in the church has had their own uh, kind of background with Revelation. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you, um, you just have this collection. Or maybe it's just me. I'll just speak for me. I feel like I have this collection of things that are Revelation-related. <laughs> so my first interaction with end times things um, was when I was seven and I don't know why my parents thought it was a good idea to bring me to church that night we had evening service like I'm sure you guys did here and they were showing those George do you remember what those movies were called those really spooky scary end times movies yeah, so The Thief in the Night, The Thunder, Lightning, whichever one, that was the first one I saw. You know, the scariest one. And my parents, who wouldn't even let me watch the Halloween edition of Little House on the Prairie, some reason, let me go watch that. True story. Scared me to death. <laughs> and as I was coming tonight, you know, all I could hear in my head was, I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change. Yeah, just me. Nobody else knows that song, <laughs> except for George and Paul. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pastor Greg has accused George and I of being the only ones keeping the Christian music from the 70s alive. And that's all right. Amen. Amen. There we go. So, you know, that was the beginning of my education at seven. Um, and, and then when Pastor Greg really came to be our youth pastor, 
later on. This was something that he had gone through um, at some point, you know, done a series on it. And I was in Christian school at the time, and there was, um, I think I took a, a course on things like this, and I even had to have him sign off on it. I had to go have a pastor sign off on what our church believed about it, and that was my my first introduction to the idea of pre-tribulation and mid-tribulation and post-tribulation, and Beth will not be talking about any of those things tonight. But you have a background in it. And then at some point, I read this book, and it was a great piece of Christian fiction, really thick book, called Antiochus, and, mm, Antiochus Epiphanes, or something like that. I can spell it. I don't know why I can't say it at the moment. But it was this, it was um, a historical figure. He was the one who came after Alexander the Great died and his, um, his empire split up. And you had the group that went to, that became the Ptolemies in Egypt. And then you had the Seleucids, which is who this guy was. And then Another, so you had all of these groups, and it was very historical in that sense, and it was basically a, a fictional but historical telling of what the Maccabee books talk about as, the, as how the temple was um, defiled, and this was all before uh, Jesus returned, and this was in that intertestamental period, real things that happened. And one of the things I loved about that book is that it pulled in all the scripture, like it was bouncing back and forth between the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. And, and again, that was my first interaction with, oh, Daniel is not just a book about Daniel and the lion's den and, and um, the three boys in the fiery furnace and making those connections. <clears throat> and then later on... Um, you all might remember the, the Left Behind series. There were so many books, so many of them. And for whatever I thought about the writing, and I, did, I, I didn't read them all, I listened to them all on book tape. I had a particularly long commute at the time. And I would listen to them all and I thought, you know, the level of the, of the dialogue and the writing was meh. But the, the scripture <clears throat> was amazing. I learned so much of just the scripture because I know that the gentleman who was doing that background part of it was solid in his scripture. And so, again, little bits of layers everywhere. And this is, the book of Revelation is difficult, I think, for people who are linear, who are um, literal, <laughs> also me, and, um, and, and maybe struggle with the philosophical, struggle with the... Um, just thinking in, in layers and in abstract and in symbols. Um, it is why I struggled always in English literature class, not because I didn't love the books, not because I didn't want to read them, and not because I couldn't interact with them. But the minute you said that character there stood for this, that, and the other thing, I'm like, now you lost me. And so Revelation is one of those things, is one of those books, is one of those... Um, challenges. And one of the things, <clears throat> as I picked up on what Pastor gave me for tonight, um, I was flipping through some of the slides, and I wanted to just review them. Oh, you guys really got stuck with the B team today. Am I not pointing it in the right direction? I am. So I wanted to review the seals, the first six seals. What's that? Oh, well, who knew? How long were the rest of you going to sit there before you told me I was changing it over here? Because it's not changing it over there. Oh, boy. Thank you, Brandon. So I got to point it this way and look this way? Is that how this works? Oh my gosh. All right, there we go. Thank you. Hang on. Now I got it. <laughs> I don't have this problem downstairs. All right. <clears throat> 
So I did just want to look through these because as I was backtracking in the information um, that he gave me, because they, where we're going to pick up, they call it an interlude or an intermission between those first six seals and, um, and the seventh seal. And as I was looking through them, just thought, so this first one, it says the white horse conquest. I looked in there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow. He was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. So the first seal. And then, and again, as I was listening to those books all those years ago, this was, there was a lot of great background there by somebody with a really good um, ability to take the scripture and paint a, a word picture. And now we have the red horse is war. And then it says another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. So the things that continue to happen on the earth get progressively worse. And then the third seal is the black horse and his famine. And from Revelation 6, 5, and 6, it says, There before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. And so, so far, we have someone who has ridden out, bent on conquest of the earth, and then one that is bent on war and making men slay each other. And then you have famine on top of that. And then the fourth seal said, I looked and there before me was a pale horse and its rider was death and Hades was following close behind him and they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. He just stopped there, and I might not have the biggest imagination, but I can count. And thinking, a fourth of the earth. So now you've already got... The, you've already got so much confusion and commotion on the earth. And then a fourth of the earth, through all of these terrible things, is happening. And then you can just imagine... I mean, just think back two years to how frightening it was suddenly to be told to go home and stay home because it'll all be better in two weeks. And to watch your stores not be able, you not be able to find toilet paper. And bottles of water, I don't know what the bottles of water thing was because the faucet still worked. But all of those things like you'd never experienced before. Like I am old enough to remember George and I as little kids in the back of a station wagon on a gas line as little bitty kids when there wasn't enough gas. And I wasn't old enough to realize how scary that must have been for my parents at the time, but I do remember it. Um, I remember being afraid enough two years ago thinking, what happens if we can't get to the grocery store? I have children at home to feed, which doesn't make me unique. It just, this, this was my own thought. How do I get enough food and what kind of food do I, it was frightening enough, and it was just for that moment in time, but to think how frightening it would be at this point in time when there was famine and there was plague and wild beasts on the earth. It sounds like the newest Jurassic Park movie that's coming out with wild beasts everywhere. It is, it is beyond our comprehension, but almost not considering the moments of real uncertainty and fear that we all lived with in the last few years. And then the fifth seal of martyrdom. It says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained, clothed in righteousness, told to wait. And I want to read you a verse from Revelation 24, 20, verse 4. And all those years ago as a little girl when I was watching that movie and, spoiler alert, they were getting beheaded <laughs> at the end of the movie. And I thought, well, this is disturbing. 
Um, but I thought that that was, at the time, just the movie's way of making it as dramatic and frightening as they possibly could. And it was years, way too many years probably, before I realized that that's what the Bible says. And in Revelation 20, verse 4, it says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. I think looking back, I probably heard more over the years as a young person about um, not even if the church was going to go before uh, the tribulation started, but just pounding it through our heads why we were going to go through first. And I, I understand why the church needs to teach its doctrine and teach what it believes, but I feel like there was something missing in our, at least in my teaching as a young person, because there was a lot of this that wasn't talked about. It's like we were focusing on that one point, and I think the, you know, the I wish we'd all been ready. They were focusing on the scare you to make sure that you're all set so that when the trumpet sounds, you can go. And then in seminary classes later on, right after college, I, we took a class, and I forget what the class was called, but it, it went through talking about different people and their personalities and how that type of message only works for one particular set of the population, that not everybody can be scared into it. Like that kind of message is lost on a big chunk of the population. And so that's not the only message that you can, <clears throat> I don't mean a different message other than Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That is not what I mean. But I mean this type of talking about the end of, of the world and the tribulation that you can't scare everybody into things. That's not how everybody is wired. And then the sixth seal of calamity, and it says, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. And part of that, I have been teaching the exact other end of this downstairs in kids' ministry. We have just finished on Wednesday night going through the seven days of creation. I just finished spending weeks trying to find different visual ways to explain to the kids those first days of creation and how God separated. And what did he mean when he separated the waters above and the waters below and all of those things. And then we see here in Revelation, it's almost like he's hitting the reverse button. And how frightening, though, because if that's not all symbolism, to me as I read, the stars in the sky fell to earth and the, as late figs dropped from a fig tree. Like he's not just saying the words, he's giving another example so you understand exactly how it means. So if we're going to take that literally, that is an earthquake, a great earthquake. It's the sun turning black, the moon turning blood red, and the stars literally falling to the earth. And smarter people than me in here could all probably give an explanation as to what a whole bunch of stars suddenly falling to earth are going to look like. And then the sky, and this is where my imagination leads me, the sky receding like a scroll. Rolling, it, sounds like a, it sounds like a hymn, it, or words from a hymn, rolling up and every mountain and island being removed. Like, how do you even picture that? just total and utter chaos. And I can't even imagine how anyone is still alive and managing at that point. And, and in Revelation 6, 15 through 17, if you've just had your Bibles open through this, um, this is as good a place to kind of pick up and read together. It does talk about what the humans are doing at this point. 
Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. Oh, I went too far. Thank you, whoever managed to get that on the back. Thank you. It says, then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man, they hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? So those words also tell me that they, at least one group of people at this point in time know what's going on. It's not just some cataclysmic thing that they know that this is the wrath of God somehow on them. And then when you move on to chapter 7, it's like God hits the pause button somehow. And it is an interlude, or as the, one of the commentaries said, an intermission. So the verses and the slides we just went through talk about what God is doing to his enemies. And then chapter 7 reveals what's happening to God's people. And so in, if you just continue on Revelation 7, we're going to read 1 through 10. I don't know if that's what that's. Nope, that's not what that's going to do. All right, that, we're going to have to just look at it in our Bibles. It says, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon and Levi and Issachar and Zebulun and Joseph and Benjamin. And after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hand, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And this 144,000, I think, is where some people get all hung up <clears throat> and it's, again, one of those places where are you talking literally? Are you talking symbolically? You go through, and if you go through and look at those, you know that those, um, even the tribes are a little, a little bit lopsided um, in the way that they're, <clears throat> they're mentioned. And at some point, the um, Jehovah's Witnesses had said that they were the 144,000 until apparently they exceeded 144,000, and that, that sort of went out the window, and they had to refigure that somehow. <clears throat> and and the, the understanding of most people is not, or at least most of the commentaries, is that it is a symbolic number, and that um, those, those were these numbers of perfection. And so here, let me see. I'm going to skip past that. Oh, no. All right, you're not going to have that writing. So it says, we're told that 144,000 to be sealed are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. Um, and again, there are, it talks about uh, some people believing it's the remnant of Israel. Um, only God is going to know who those, which tribes people are from. Um, one of the things that I love, though, in those verses is at the end, after it's gone through all of those 12,000 of this tribe and that tribe and the other tribe, it says in verse 9, after this, after, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count 
from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne. And one of the commentators said, that was, that was the Gentile Christians. That was the rest of us. That was how they were interpreting it, that it wasn't just those 144,000, but those other people there that couldn't, couldn't be counted from every tribe and nation and language. And so, to me, this is part of a, a personal frustration with Revelation is that you can get caught up in that stuff. And you can have really, really long arguments with people who believe everything you believe except for three words. And those three words are the things that you're going to have three hours worth of, <laughs> of unpleasant discourse about. Um, or, or whole chunks of it. But I love the fact that that, that was... Um, that was just, it, it, is including, it is including the Jews and it is including the Gentiles. It is including us. And it says that second interpretation teaches a symbolic approach to the numbers um, and talking about the numbers of perfection and things like that. And there are some people, my aunt was one of them. She was the quintessential little old church lady and she loved numbers and she loved all the symbolism of the numbers in the Bible. And if you've ever run across somebody like that, the 12 and the seven days of creation and the, all of those things and you can chase that around through the Bible and get some really interesting information out of it. If that is your thing. Um, so, when he talks about the seals on the forehead, and this was something that we don't use seals so much anymore. I mean, like you seal an envelope, you, you seal a Ziploc bag, you close it, you, but not the way that it would have been talked about in these days. Now, the sealing that you do prevents tampering. So you might see that if you watch cop shows that they seal off a crime scene so that you know if you know, somebody's gone through it that it's been tampered with. Um, it marks ownership. Any, um, any amount of watching any of those old shows where they would have their seal and they would melt some wax and put it in the wax and close it with their seal and that seal was recognizable as, be as belonging to them, whoever them was, a Roman official, a rich man, a king, a priest, those seals um, indicated ownership. And it also signified importance you're not gonna go put a seal on your grocery list. Your grocery list isn't that important. But if you have uh, a birth certificate, you're gonna have that official seal on it. If you're going to have an adoption paper, if I pulled out my adoption papers myself, there's a special seal on it from when those papers were signed. Um, so you put those seals on important things. We are important to God, those seals are um, the, the mark that he was putting on these people that indicated importance. And it certifies genuineness. So again, if you take your driver's license, for instance, and you put it on a copy machine and somehow you coax it into making a black and white copy for you, that's not genuine. That's just something that's worthless. But that original um, document that has those seals on it, that's genuine. And for the people here, it's it protected them from the judgment. God stopped the four angels. He stopped the next seal. It, he stopped the next bit of judgment. And he said, wait a minute. We're going to um, mark the people. We're going to seal them. And one of the things as I was reading through this is, I just have to find the right page here, um, that God... God marked them with an invisible seal. The, the, the way that it's described is that the seal that we have of God, even us on us, we don't have some marking on us. If I passed you in the grocery store and I didn't know you, I wouldn't necessarily know whether you were a Christian or not. But the words that you use and your actions and the things that come from you, those are the things that represent that seal of God on your life. And ours are not this outward um, something that you've got on your body. But the mark of the beast is going to be an outward sign. And there was a very distinct difference in the seal of the mark, which was on the forehead or on the hand. And 
it doesn't take much poking around on just recent news articles to see how easy it is. All that technology has been around for a long time. I suspect anybody in here who has a pet could have that microchip in it. So you know where that dog is anywhere. You know where that cat is anywhere. Um, that technology has been around for a long time. And it's available now. I, it really, it was within the last week or so that I saw one of those articles kind of pass me by that talked about being able to have some sort of implant. So instead of a barcode, it's just your wrist. I want to go buy a Coke, run my wrist over a scanner. I want to go pay for my groceries. All of those things are here. And I think you can also get wrapped up in that. And again, this is where... Um, for years, I sort of took a, a back seat to, to a lot of this kind of studying because to me, it was like I, I didn't want to spend time getting wrapped up in, in the fear of that coming, in, in trying to make some kind of prediction that Jesus was coming tomorrow. He's coming next week. I'm pretty sure my Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. So I'm no girl, but I don't know either. <laughs> and... And he said to be ready, but then I'm going to go about my business. Because even the people, like you can look through the New Testament at, at those disciples, those people, they thought Jesus was really coming. Like they took him really literally. They were expecting him to come back in their lifetimes. Like they didn't get the whole 2,000 years thing. <laughs> and so we don't know. And so you can get, I, I remember when that, that big it might have even been called the beast. There was supposedly some big computer in, I don't know, Belgium, Luxembourg. I don't know what it would be doing there. But some big, huge computer when I was a teenager. Like, oh, it can store everybody's information. Okay. So can my iPhone now. I mean, <laughs> so for me, it was the day-to-day. -day. It was the doing what God wanted me to do today, tomorrow. But understanding as much as I could about this. And so when God talks about his servants being marked with the seal, it signifies that we are members of God's family. It signified that those people were members of God's family, purchased by the Son, filled by the Spirit, and the unbelievers had that mark of the beast on their hand and on their forehead. Now it says they're not exempt from physical harm. Like that was I was thinking about that too. Like this comes in between six and seven. So we've already had the moon go to, to blood and we've already had the sun go dark and, and we've already had stars fall from the sky. And this is the part where, I don't know, and maybe Pastor Greg knows, and you can ask him. Maybe Pastor Derek knows. He'll be here next week. You can ask him. But this is where my mind makes a parallel back to the plagues in Egypt. And, and the people of God who lived in the land of Goshen. And you had all of those pla plagues that went through. And some of them, the Bible talks about, didn't affect the people in the land of Goshen. And some of them, I don't know, if the whole Nile turned red, that was them too. Um, if there were frogs everywhere that probably crossed over into the Goshen neighborhoods. But those really terrible plagues at the end didn't affect God's people. And so... Is it sort of that same thing here? I don't know. But they are sealed. God puts a stop to what's going on. And they belong to Jesus. We as, as Christians are sealed. We belong to Jesus. And even though it's that invisible seal, the expectation on our lives is that we are going to be that witness for Christ that people can see. Um, and I think if you if you can't if you're not able to draw some of the the practical what is meaningful for my life right now tomorrow conclusions then this just becomes an interesting study of cool things that are going to happen at the end of the world that some of them I know what's going to happen some of them I don't but if you can take that that idea that you right now in this moment you do not have to wait for the six seal to be broken and God to say, okay, hold on, I got something to do before that seven one <laughs> gets done. And now you're sealed. We are sealed now. And we have that job to do now. And we are still part of that 
um, that great commission now to go and tell people that, so we don't have to go through this. So we don't have to. I have happily, true confessions, happily believed and been a pre-tribulation person my entire life. And if that is, that is mostly biblical and a little bit out of, it's such a better idea. <laughs> Truthfully, it's such a better a better plan to go in the rapture, but we are sealed now, and we have that job now, and, and you think about all of this, and this was one of the things going through those books really helped me to think through is would I really, there's no one in your life that you care about that you're going to want to have to go through these things. Yes, will there, it, it, does it seem clear? It seems clear to me that God is still making a way during this time of tribulation for people who missed, for people who didn't know, for people who hadn't given their hearts to the Lord to still do that. But it becomes so much harder. It becomes so much more dreadful, that world. And as you sit and you listen to them, that was, my, that was one of my biggest takeaways. There's no one in my life that I care about and even people I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to see. I would love it. Nobody had to go through this. Because this is, and, and to know that even at the very end, there are still people, as you get to the end of Revelation later on, who are pushing against this and rebelling against God. It's just astonishing. If you go to Revelation 7, and we, we move on just in the last few minutes to the heavenly worship. And I love this, Revelation 7, 12. And it says, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And you probably have a number of different songs going through your head. These are some great words to pull into songs that we've sung and heard that blessing and honor and power and glory and strength, and those words get used over and over again interchangeably. But as I was reading through this, I want to get this one. It says, they cried out with a loud voice. The saints in heaven are singing with one accord, and, and the confusion of Babel has ended. Like all of those thousands of years ago at the Tower of Babel when God had to confuse everyone's languages because they hadn't learned their lesson from the flood. And they were going to build this tower to heaven and, and, and show God that they were, they were important stuff and, and make, make that tower go right to him. And he said, okay, enough is enough with you guys. And you all, and, and confuse their languages. And from that moment until until they're in heaven. And then here in heaven, not only is there no tears, no sickness, no poverty, no famine, all of those things are gone, but God's people have truly come together in unity at the end to sing together in one voice, and that confusion of Babel has ended. And singing together to love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. So at the end of the chapter, the last little bit is this interview. And in Revelation 7, 13 and 14. So I, I find myself having to continue to remember to think, okay, this is the Apostle John. This is John. This is John. This is John the disciple. This is, like, this is someone we know well from the Gospels, having all of these um, visions and dreams and it says one of the elders, so this is seven, Revelation 7, 13 and 14. It says one of the elders asked me, so I asked John, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? And it, John answered, sir, you know. <laughs> I'm like, oh, why don't you tell me? And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. And you think, it is not hard to understand why John is confused. He's like, who are they? Where'd they come from? And John's like, you tell me. It sounds like he said it better than that. 
I'd love to know what the Greek word for sir is. But sir, you know, <laughs> as a teacher, you hear different variations of that sometimes in the classroom. And so this elder is getting John to ask the right question so he can answer it. And he says, what is the difference between the way the world sees the poor and persecuted for God and the way God sees them? And, and we know from going back to um, Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, how God talked about the poor and the persecuted and saying the last will be first and the first will be last. And how God has this completely different idea as, as to how the world works and who's important and than, than we do. And God sees these people who had been persecuted for him as conquerors, who had washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They've become united with Christ through his blood, and they're standing before God's throne. Like, they, they're not just sitting on his right hand. They're standing before God's throne, these people that have been persecuted for him. God has honored them and put them before his throne. And so then another question is what is the blessing that they receive? And the, the Bible says, and it, they give it a, a few more references here, but it says, he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle or his tent over them. This is the shade or the covering of the glory cloud, which hovered over both the earth at creation and Israel in the wilderness. So now these people who are standing there washed in the blood of the lamb who had been persecuted are standing before God's throne and, and the glory of God is over them. And if you want to read that, if you go back into the Old Testament and you read about that tabernacle in the wilderness and how the glory of God, I think it was even called the Shekinah glory over that, that's God is covering them. And what will be the result of the blessing? And it says there are seven promises of the blessing. They're never going to hunger. They're never going to thirst. They're shielded from the sun, the wind. The lamb will be their shepherd, springs of living water, and God will wipe away their tears. Their resurrected bodies cannot suffer pain or discomfort of any kind. And this is what, of course, we're looking for when we are called home to our heavenly home as well. And so as you go through, and this is my encouragement to you, is to, to go home through your own Bible. If you've got a study Bible that has great little teeny-weeny notes that you need a, a microscope for at the bottom, um, to take a look at where they're going to bounce you around in the Bible to other places, to make connected verses, and to go and to look at that. I'm also um, happy before you go even to make copies of what pastor gave me so much more than I could have managed. But for me in this one little spot of time dropping into your Bible study is what I bring myself to any study of this is the knowledge that this is hard for me, um, for the way I think. It's probably hard for a lot of people. But it's hard for me to grasp it. I think what also comes from me is a, a concern that I, that I don't mess up the doctrinal part of it um, because that's important to me and knowing that this is not the area that I would comfortably stand up and say, now this is what this says definitively and this is what this is, but this is what I bring to you verses that have this be these beautiful words, these reminders that God stopped the punishment that God stopped the destruction for that moment to cover those believers that even in the middle of this great time of tribulation, he never forgets about those people who are left. He never forgets about them. And there's these moments where they can still make that connection to Christ, whether they have to also suffer martyrdom in the end or not, that he still has that moment for them. And then to do what you can to do your own study through this. Because I really think this is not the group of people who are coming to a, um, you know, a, a, a outdoor rally to get saved for the first time. You, have, you are all in a place of study and maturity in the Word. So take this chapter um, that I probably have not gone as deep with as one of the other pastors and do that depth on your own. 
be interested enough in this to go read this through. Listen to it on your Bible app a few times in a few different versions so you can hear the different nuances of it. Look in your study Bible and see what it says. If you have a commentary on Revelation, I could have just sat and read through this for hours. Um, so interesting knowing that when it's, at, this is not the Bible, this is a commentary. So, you know, one commentator says blah, 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 blah. And the other one says blah, 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 blah. And I, you probably are going to get a different one for everyone. But to pull that together and then to let the Lord talk to you about it. Say, God, what am I supposed to do with all of this information? And to me, in Beth's opinion, any study of the book of Revelation should just be turning us around and saying, Go out and make sure that people hear. Go out and make sure that Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. So we're going to close just in prayer tonight. And there's some snacks downstairs um, and some fellowship. And, and if you're able, I, I wouldn't run out without a little fellowship and just saying hi to everyone. But let's just close in prayer tonight. God, I thank you. You said every bit of your word is for our instruction, our reproof, our correction, our teaching, God, and the easy stuff and the hard stuff, and you wrote it all. And you meticulously gave the Apostle John these visions and these dreams so that he could write them down and so that thousands of years later we could sit in Taunton, Massachusetts and study them and look at them and figure out what are you trying to say and, and is this vision of the stars coming from the sky. Is that the literal part? And then is this part over here about the 144,000, is that symbolic but not really just 144,000? And I pray that you will help us walk through maybe the mist of all of that and to make the things clear to us that you want us to know and at the end of the day to remember that you love us, that you love the people of this world and it is not your desire to see any of them miss their opportunity to be in heaven with you. And we thank you for that. God, I thank you that you are a good, good father and that that is who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you, everybody.